Hey everybody, it is Sunday, February 25th in the morning. I wanted to officially open this vlog. I still owe you a wrap up of Confess by Colleen Hoover because this was the last book that I finished before ending the last vlog, which was kind of ended in a rush because I was in a hurry to get it edited and uploaded. And I didn't know if I was going to have time to update you on this yesterday and still edit everything to get it uploaded in time. So this of course is a romance by Colleen Hoover. It's one of her older ones. It was published in 2015 and I went into it a little bit trepidatiously, but I actually really enjoyed this more than I thought that I was going to. So this follows our main character Auburn and she's kind of lost everything at this point in her life. She was recently uprooted from Portland, Oregon to Dallas. You find out later in the book why that is but she's not happy to be there. She's feeling very unfulfilled in her life as a hairdresser. Things are just not going her way and then one day on her walk home she passes by this gallery and she notices a help wanted sign in the gallery and that kind of gets her thrust into the orbit of Owen Gentry. He is the artist and owner of the gallery and he paints confessions. So basically people can anonymously confess and they toss confessions through a slot in his door and he holds on to them and eventually he might paint some of them and then he opens his gallery once a month and people can come and purchase the confessions that have been painted and he essentially needs her help in order to handle the transactions when he is open and so she works for him for a night and they obviously have a very big connection there's a lot of chemistry between them but there's a lot of complications that are going on in Auburn's life and again you find out what those are throughout the book and there are also complications going on through Owen's life he's keeping some secrets as well including the fact that he already knows who Auburn is but you're following them and their chemistry as things are kind of working against them and and tearing them apart. And like I said, I actually really enjoyed my reading experience of this. Colleen Hoover has been one of my favorite contemporary romance authors for a long time, but I do find that some of hers are hit or miss. I recently read Heartbones. That was the last book that I read by hers. It was a 2020 release, and that was probably my least favorite Colleen Hoover that I've ever read, one of the least, because it just felt so juvenile and YA. And so I was very nervous going into this one, but I'm happy to say that I enjoyed this one. I loved both of the characters. I rooted for them. There definitely was that instant attraction that I don't always get along with and I do wish it had been a little bit more slow burn but you can legitimately feel the chemistry and connection between the two. I feel like Colleen Hoover was able to make it work for me a little bit better. Do I wish it had been slow burn? Yes but there are some circumstances in here that didn't make slow burn possible for the two of them. Overall I just really adored both of the characters. I especially adored Owen. I absolutely loved him in the story and what he was willing to do for Auburn and how much he just cared for her and wanted the best for her and so ultimately I had a very positive rating experience with this and I gave it a four stars and I'm very very grateful because a couple of the Colleen Hoovers that I read last year, including Too Late, which was a romantic suspense, didn't really do it for me. So I was kind of worried that maybe I was shifting away from her as an author, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's just a case of some are going to work for me and some are not. So that's the update on Confess. And then immediately after finishing up Confess, I had absolutely nothing else to read. So I went ahead and picked up Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. I've mentioned this before, but I moderate a book club on Goodreads. It's called the Bookworm Bitches Book Club. And there are a few yearly challenges that we're doing, including a TBR takedown. And there are 52 prompts in there that give you ideas on how to select a book from your TBR in order to help you whittle it down. And one of the prompts was to sort your TBR by the highest rated and to read one of the first 10 books that are listed. And Project Hail Mary was one of them. So I decided to pick it up. I read The Martian by Andy Weir last year and I really enjoyed it. I don't think I enjoyed it as much as a lot of other people did, but I did enjoy it enough to make me want to pick this one up. This follows our main character, Dr. Ryland Grace, and the story opens with him waking up after being in a coma. We don't know for how long he's been in a coma. He has no idea where he is or what is going on. You're kind of following him as his memories are coming back to him as he realizes where he is and what he is doing. But essentially there is something out there. There is an organic life form that is basically draining the sun of its energy and it's going to essentially cause an ice age and obliterate mankind for all intents and purposes. And so he is being sent on a one-way mission. It's basically a suicide mission to help stop these life forms which are called astrophage and figure out how to stop them and prevent them from doing this. And so I'm currently at the point where he is apparently meeting an alien life form and learning how to communicate with them which is weird. It's not really my thing. I don't love alien storylines, but I also feel like I started this at the wrong time because I'm very distracted right now. I have been extremely busy this past week. Yesterday, I spent all day in a reading retreat and today I'm actually getting ready to head to a conference, a work conference in New Orleans for two days. So later this afternoon, I will be heading out and I will be gone. There's a lot going on in life at the moment, so I'm not giving it the full attention that it deserves, especially for books like these, which are heavily scientific. I will say that the audiobook narrator for this is fantastic. I wish I would have looked it up before I started filming because he is phenomenal. He has to do so many different accents in this book. I will be sure to look up the name and post it here on the screen because if you have an opportunity to listen to this, I highly recommend. You know, we're dealing with space and major international operations and you're going to come in contact with a lot of different nationalities. And I feel like the narrator in this story for Project Hail Mary does a fantastic job. He also captures Andy Weir's humor fantastically as well. He has the right inflections and the surprises and all of the emotions that you would expect from somebody reading these books. And it's a fantastic job. 
So I'm enjoying the narration part of it and I'm enjoying the story when I have an opportunity to allow myself to get sucked into it. It's just at this point, I'm just like so frazzled that I'm not giving it all of the attention that I really want to be giving it. I probably won't have much if any opportunity to read it over the next couple of days. So there is going to be a distance between me and the story, but I am looking forward to finishing it. Also, and I didn't mention this in the previous vlog, but I did start my next immersion read and that is Defend the Dawn by Bridget Kemmerer. This is a young adult slash new adult fantasy trilogy and I read Defy the Night a couple of years ago and I really enjoyed it. This was actually sent to me as a gift and it's okay so far. I have moved quite heavily away from YA since the time that I read the first book and I'm looking for much weightier and complex fantasies so it's not quite doing it for me in that regard but I enjoy the characters and it's definitely on the shorter side so I will be able to stick it out and see it through. All right that is the reading update y'all. As per usual it went on a little bit longer than I would have liked because I had a lot to update you on but as I mentioned I am essentially spending the day getting some things done around the house so that I can prepare to go and leave for the conference. I have to leave at one o'clock which is basically in about three hours so I don't have a lot of time to stick around and get things done but I had to film my TBR video so I thought that it would be the perfect opportunity to sit down and open the vlog. For now y'all I need to stop blabbering and get on with my day but I will check back with you when I have more reading updates. <music> talk. It is currently Wednesday afternoon and I am so exhausted. I think I mentioned in the opening clip for this vlog that I have been at a work conference. I had to leave Sunday afternoon. We got back yesterday afternoon and since then it has just been basically catching up on work things, home things, booktube things, all of the things. And also I really didn't even have any reading updates because this entire time I have been listening to Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir whenever I can. I started it last week and there's just been hardly any time to actually listen to it at all but I finally did and I really enjoyed it. I think I actually enjoyed it more than The Martian. I really enjoyed the dynamic between the main character and the alien life form that he encountered while in space. So backtracking a little bit, I might have mentioned what this is about, but basically following our main character, Dr. Ryland Grace, and essentially Earth is in danger of being destroyed because energy from the sun is being depleted and they find out that it's being depleted by this specific organic life form called astrophage. So there's this massive project going on to send some scientists up in space. They're going to have to be up there for years. It's basically a suicide mission. They're not planning on coming back. And Dr. Ryland Grace ends up being one of the people to go up in space. And he's essentially put into a coma for years until it's time to wake up and start working on the things because it's going to take like years to get out to where they need to be. And it's wild. And then eventually he wakes up from his coma. He realizes that the people he was on the spaceship with are dead. He is all alone. And then eventually he encounters an alien life form and he calls him Rocky. And I found it absolutely fascinating how he and Rocky build communication between each other. Like they build common vocabulary. They learn to speak to each other. They teach each other about their atmosphere and their science and their life on these other planets. And it was absolutely fascinating. And then they're kind of working together because both of their planets are having the same problem with astrophage. Rocky himself was sent out on a very large spaceship with a bunch of other people to try to stop astrophage and Rocky too is alone. So it is definitely about their relationship, their friendship, and they're building a shared culture, a shared vocabulary, shared science, trying to save their planets from ultimate annihilation. And it was just really engaging. It was really funny. I also think I mentioned that the narrator for Project Hail Mary is flipping phenomenal. His name is Ray Porter. If you have the opportunity to listen to this on audiobook, I highly, highly, highly recommend because his inflections are perfect. His accents are great. He just does a phenomenal job. It's almost like having kind of a full cast in one, if you will. And I just really, really enjoyed the way that he narrated this. Now, of course, like with The Martian, I understood absolutely nothing about what happened in here, like science-wise and stuff, but you definitely understand the human aspect, the emotional aspect. You know, the main character is on the spaceship. He knows that he's going to die, but he 
also has to save humanity. And then you're also exploring what it means to discover an alien race and what that could look like if we actually made contact with somebody out there in space. You know what I mean? So it was just really phenomenal. It was a really good time. I wish my reading experience hadn't been as disjointed as it was. I think I would have been able to get a little bit more out of it. Definitely more emotion out of it if it hadn't been spread out over a week's time. But I just was really having a good time any time I was able to pick it up and listen to it. So I definitely enjoyed it. I'm giving it a solid four stars. In terms of what I'm going to read next, I haven't officially made the decision, but it's already February 28th. Tomorrow is the very final day of February. So I'm certainly going to just start my March TBR. I think I'm going to go ahead and get Dash Hound Through the Snow out of the way because that's that cute little cozy mystery that's kind of a one-off on my TBR. I think it's going to be quick, fun, a palette cleanser, not something that's going to take up too much brain energy. We'll see how it goes, but that's available for my library. I might as well just go ahead and get it done, get it out of the way. For the time being, it is lunchtime and I'm going to use this time to try to get a little bit more reading done in Defend the Dawn by Bridget Kemmerer because it's been a long time since I've been able to pick up that book and it's not that long, but it's taking me forever to read. That's the plan. I'm so sorry for the lack of content so far. I will try to make up for it later in the vlog and thank you for sticking with me. I'll talk to you soon. Hey everybody, it is Friday morning and I'm on my way to work. But since my last update, I did start and finish Dachshund Through the Snow by David Rosenfeld. I didn't really feel like that was a book that required a mid-read check-in, so that's why I didn't really come on and say anything before finishing. It was basically exactly like I thought it would be. It was a cozy mystery. It followed our main character, Andy Carpenter, who is a defense attorney. And in this story, he and his wife are trying to help this little boy, Danny. He made a wish, you know, on one of those Christmas gifting trees for less fortunate children. He made a wish that his his dad would come home and upon further investigation they find out that his dad kind of went on the run because the police suspect him of a murder that happened 14 years ago and so Andy takes on the case to try to get this guy off of murder and to bring him home to his son. So this was just as expected you know it was a good fun time it was nothing substantial it was nothing that was going to stick with me. I think my favorite thing about this book was that Andy Carpenter is a huge dog lover he is also a rescuer and a big proponent of animal rights and David Rosenfeld himself is that. I think when when I read his bio, it said that he currently has like 27 dogs, you know, dogs that are too old or too sick to be wanted by anybody else. And he has rescued thousands of dogs. And that's basically my life mission, right? I really want to get more heavily into the rescue field. I would love to have my own little rescue one day, even if it's in a very, very small capacity to help alleviate some of the overpopulation crisis that we have here in South Mississippi. I have no idea how I would do it, but that is the ultimate goal. And that's one of the reasons why I am in school to eventually help me get to that place. So I really loved the animal focus aspect of this. And you know, it was just a good fun time. I'm giving it a three stars. That is the first book on my February TBR done. And it is only just now March 1st. And immediately after finishing that, I picked up The Haunting of Maddie Claire by Simone St. James. No, that is not a book that is originally on my March TBR. However, it is a book that was kindly sent to me by Amanda over at On the Middle Shelf. She is one of the booktube besties. And as I mentioned before, I was part of their virtual reading retreat that happened last Friday and Saturday. And she kindly sent me a couple of books. And one of them was The Haunting of Maddie Claire. And that one was immediately available to me from my library so I wanted to go ahead and pick it up and additionally I think I can go ahead and fit it into my TBR because one of the challenge polls was to read a book featuring a personal phobia and while I wouldn't say ghosts and hauntings are an active personal phobia and it's not something I really fear in general I would say that if I were being haunted I would be pretty afraid right so I'm gonna go ahead and count it this is one of Simone St. James older stories I don't know exactly how old I think it's like roughly about 10 years old and this is actually a historical paranormal where her newest releases have been more contemporary paranormals so this one is set in 
in 1920s England and it follows our main character Sarah Piper. She's kind of down on her luck. She's all alone in the world. Her parents have died. She's kind of an orphan. I believe she's in her mid-20s at this point and really she takes any job that she can get from a temp agency and one day they call her to assist a man named Alistair and Alistair has a very interesting proposal for her. He is apparently a ghost hunter or at least a studier of ghosts and his assistant is currently away and he needs some help with a ghost that does not like men and so he enlists Sarah's help to go to this estate where there's this apparently angry ghost and try to help her like move on essentially and so we're following this process as she and Alistair go she meets the family of this ghost and they find out that apparently when she was a young girl probably when she was like 11 or 12 Maddie Claire just showed up on their doorstep she was pretty much beaten she was in terrible shape she was shaking she was afraid and then seven years later when she was about 19 she hung herself and ever since she's been kind of this angry spirit in their barn and it's time for her to go and so that's why they called Alistair in we've already followed Sarah as she's encountered this ghost twice and how very like angry this spirit is and so I'm not entirely sure what the trajectory of the rest of the story is I'm not sure where it's going but Alistair's real assistant has just showed up and I think that there's going to be some kind of like romance between him and Sarah so there's a little bit of a romance tossed in here which is interesting and overall I'm really enjoying it I'm having a great time I wasn't sure how I was going to feel with the historical aspect of it but I'm really really enjoying this one and I just love the way Simone St. James does ghosts so I'm here for it so I should finish that probably not today but tomorrow for sure and then we'll move on with the rest of the March TBR so far so good anyway y'all another busy day today at work I've got to get going but I will check in with you later <laughs> Happy Monday, long time no talk. I didn't come on here and update at all over the weekend. I spent Saturday primarily just doing chores around my house. I had my nail appointment first thing on Saturday, then I went grocery shopping, and then I came home and I was just really productive. I did all of the laundry, I edited a video and a bunch of other house chores, and then yesterday I spent running all day sprints and I honestly didn't think of picking up my camera at once. So I apologize for the lack of updates, but in all honesty, I only just finished The Haunting of Maddie Claire yesterday. Yesterday, so I didn't really have too much in the way of reading updates anyway. And overall, I felt like this was a very strong reading experience and definitely an interesting ghost story. I feel like the ghost in this story, Maddie Claire, was a lot more active and threatening than in Simone St. James's more contemporary novels. Maddie Claire is an active poltergeist is probably the right word. She's very angry and this is about her wanting to take her revenge and she's trying to use Sarah to kind of get her revenge and she's holding the lives of Alistair and Matthew over Sarah. Like if you don't help me, I'm going to take them. I'm going to do what I want with them. And so Sarah is determined to get Maddie's revenge for her or at least get her to find some peace with it. You know what I mean? So this is about that journey. This is about trying to find out what happened to Maddie, trying to find out who was responsible and then trying to get justice for Maddie. And I really enjoyed it overall. It was a very solid reading experience. Like I said, I really enjoyed watching the relationship develop between Sarah and Matthew and then ultimately finding out what happened to her and how they go about putting her spirit to rest. So in the end, I gave this a four stars and I'm very, very pleased. And now I'm even more we're looking forward to reading the rest of her backlist. And then actually soon after I started Maddie Claire, The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn came in from my library. So as soon as I finished Maddie Claire, I immediately jumped into The Diamond Eye. And this is a World War II historical fiction that's following our main character, Mila. And she actually became known as Lady Death. She joined the army once Germans started invading Russia and she became a very notorious sniper. And at the start of the story, it starts in 1942, which I believe is like the present day for this story. And she already has 300 kills under her belt. And at the start of the story, she is headed to Washington, D.C. to speak with the president and his wife. And you're flashing back to once she first joins the army and as she becomes a sniper and as she starts to lead men and be a commander and all of her kills and things like that. She also has a son and that's one of the reasons why she's doing this. One of the reasons why she's fighting is to set a good example for her son and to make Russia a safe place for her son to grow up in. And of course, you're following all the challenges she's facing as a woman in the Red Army. Of course, a lot of people don't believe that she's a sniper. They don't believe that she's doing what she says she is, but she's definitely a strong, skilled 
skilled, talented woman. So you're following that journey. You're also flashing to the present day. We're getting some perspective of Eleanor Roosevelt through like journal entries that she's making. We're also getting the perspective of another marksman. We don't know who he is yet, but he's essentially been sent to Washington DC to assassinate FDR and he plans on blaming Mila for it. And I'm really intrigued to see how that goes down. Right now we're spending a lot more time in the past than the present, but pretty soon the past is going to meet the present because they're not too terribly far apart. I'm very much enjoying it. Nobody's surprised by that. I have read two other books, The Alice Network and The Rose Code. I don't think I've read any other books, but I've absolutely loved both of those. And so I am really enjoying this one and I'm looking forward to following Mila's journey. But for now, y'all, it is time for me to go ahead and head into work. This is the first day of registration, which means it's likely going to be very, very busy. And so I'm just going to go ahead and buckle down and get the day done. And I will check in with you when I have more updates. It is currently Tuesday morning on the 5th. I'm actually just about to get ready to go to work, but I got some book mail yesterday that I wanted to show you. It's actually the same book, but one of them is a special edition. So I wanted to go ahead and come on here and show you. So first is what I believe is just the standard UK edition of Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I love the UK versions of these books way better than the US editions. The US editions have people on them and I just don't care for that. So as soon as I knew this was up for pre-order, I went ahead and grabbed it from Blackwell's since Book Depository is no more. All right. IP. And so I just absolutely love these covers. And then there's actually gold foiling on the naked hardcover. Isn't that gorgeous? I love it. So if you're not familiar, this is the second book in Jay Kristoff's Empire of the Vampire series, which basically is this epic saga following Gabriel de Leon, who is the last Silver Saint. Silver Saints are basically, for all intents and purposes, vampire hunters, and they're trying to prevent world domination by vampires. And in the very first book, he has been captured by a vampire and he's being asked to tell his story. And so that's what we get in the very first book. And it's going to continue in this one. I hope to be getting to this one pretty soon, but I don't know if that's going to be possible at least for the next couple of months because my next grad course is starting and unfortunately there is a lot of reading involved in this one and so I don't think I'm going to have time to actually physically read anything, but this will be the next priority as soon as I have the opportunity. And then I also grabbed the Goldsboro Special Edition. It's got this beautiful silver color and then look at those bright vivid spray pages, y'all. Oh my gosh. And then here is the naked hardcover. It is purple and it's got the Voss crest on it and silver foiling. There's the spine and then it says all shall kneel on the back. Oh my gosh, I just love it. Unfortunately, I don't have any special editions of Empire of the Vampire, but at least I have this beautiful, stunning Empire of the Damned. Oh, you see Oliver over there? <laughs> he's making an appearance in my videos. He doesn't typically get shown in my videos just because he's usually off doing his own thing. But yeah, y'all, that is the update. I'm headed to work for another busy day. I don't really have a reading update at this time. I am still in the middle of The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. I'm gonna be honest, and this one is going a little bit more slowly than I would like. I think it's just because I'm not necessarily interested in the culture that we're following. We're following more of the Russian side of World War II, and that is definitely not a side that I'm as knowledgeable about, and so I should theoretically want to learn more about it. But it's it's just like not my area of interest in World War II, but I do love that we are following a female sniper. It's just going a little bit more slowly than I would have liked it. I'm not as engaged with the story as I remember being with Kate Quinn's other ones. I am enjoying it. It's just not 100% as intriguing to me as her other two books were. But anyway, y'all, the fur babies need their breakfast, so I need to head out, but I will check in with you later. Hey, y'all, it is currently Wednesday afternoon. I am sitting here at work, and I just wanted to give you an update and do a little chit chat really quick. So first, I finished The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn Quinn this morning and I ultimately really enjoyed it. I think I mentioned in a previous clip that it was dragging a little bit for me. It felt very, very long. I did not connect with this one as much as I did The Rose Code or even The Alice Network, which was my very first Kate Quinn. But I still think that this was a very intriguing and interesting story. As I mentioned, it follows our main character, Mila, who is a sniper with the Russian army during World War II. She was very instrumental in the war effort for Russia and it was very intriguing to read her story, especially because, of course, there were a lot of skeptics about her. A lot of people didn't believe that a woman could be such an effective sniper. There were people in America who didn't believe that she was a sniper at all, that it was all propaganda. The book does not span a great period of time. Like, I believe Mila enters the army at some point in maybe 1940, 1941, and by 1942 she is mostly out and she's doing like good 
world tours in America. So at the very beginning of the story, you see her entering Washington DC as she's meeting the first lady and she's going on like a goodwill tour. And then you're also in the timeline in the past as she becomes a sniper and racks up that kill count and things like that. And it felt kind of disjointed in a way because the time when she was a sniper, when you're building up to the current day of the book, which again is 1942, when she's in America doing the goodwill tour and becoming friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, it felt like that was a much longer, bigger part of the story. And then all of a sudden, bam, it's over and she's in America. Now you know that she's in America from the start of the book because that's kind of where it starts out. And then the majority of the first, I want to say maybe half or more of the book, she is in Russia in the army. And I kind of felt like it was weirdly told. I almost feel as though this could have just been a straight linear time frame where you follow her as she's joining the army and then right up until she gets to America. I didn't really feel like we needed those glimpses of America in the first half of the story. And then also I feel like there could have been a more seamless transition between her time in the army and then going to America because it felt like all of a sudden she was on the front lines, then she's injured and then bam, she's in America with really nothing else in between. So I definitely would say that there was a little bit of a pacing issue for me and there was a little bit of a disconnect between the time periods that we were covering. And also I felt like the synopsis of this book placed a lot more emphasis on her friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt that was actually portrayed in the story. I felt overall you could definitely feel like they were building a friendship, but I don't necessarily feel like that was flushed out in the story. So I also feel like that could have been explored a little bit more. And then also in America, she was also being hunted down by a marksman who wanted to take her out. And I don't really know why that was put in there because that wasn't a true part of her life. So I didn't necessarily know if that needed to be in there to really add anything to the story overall. So there were a few technical issues that I had with this one, but overall, of course, I still really enjoyed it. I feel like Kate Quinn is just such a phenomenal historical fiction author, and I just enjoy the subjects that she covers immensely. After finishing that, I picked up Be Still My Heart by Emily McIntyre and Sav R. Miller because because this was supposed to satisfy the gameplay prompt of a book related to the ocean or the sea in some capacity and this definitely takes place like near an island the ocean is a big part because a body is found in the water but i honestly got a few chapters in and it just wasn't doing it for me i really wasn't enjoying the writing style very much and i had a feeling that ultimately this was probably just going to be like a mediocre read so i decided not to continue with it and i'm going to have to try to find another book that will satisfy that prompt and then i went ahead and decided to pick up the things we leave unfinished by rebecca yaros and i am very very early days into that. I had DNF to be still my heart like halfway through my drive to work and then started the Rebecca Yaros book so I maybe got 20 minutes into the audio. From what I'm understanding we're following our main character Sloan and her grandmother recently passed away and her grandmother was a pretty notable romance author and I feel like she's going to build a romance with this man who is set to like finish the romance series that her grandmother started but she doesn't want this man to do it because she doesn't like this man's romance. You know it sounds like he's supposed to be like a very Nicholas Sparks-esque type of character and she doesn't want this guy to finish her grandmother's stories so I'm intrigued to see where it goes. That is the reading update. I will check back in with you when I have a more solid idea of the Rebecca Yaros, but that's all that I've got going on at the moment and I'll check back later. Hey everybody, it is in the afternoon on Thursday, March 7th, my birthday. I'm actually currently on my lunch break sitting in a grocery store parking lot because I have to run in really quick and get a few ingredients that I need for some vegan chili that I'm making tonight for a potluck tomorrow. But I really wanted to quickly come on here and update you because I have officially decided not to continue with The Things We Leave Unfinished by Rebecca Yaros. I was so positive when I went into that book that it was gonna be like a new favorite. Like Rebecca Yaros was going to cement herself as a new romance author for me. I don't really know why, but I just had this feeling that she was gonna be a strong contemporary romance author and that could still be the case but for some reason this book was not doing it for me. I was not getting the vibes that I was looking for. I wasn't really getting any kind of chemistry between the two characters. Now I completely get that I was very early days in the story. It wasn't the kind of story that I was looking for and I didn't want to waste my time on it. Y'all know that I have very specific requirements when it comes to romance and if I'm not getting those feelings from it pretty early on it's really not something I care to read and so I went ahead and decided to put it down. What is this? Oh my gosh I have something on my glasses right here like 
yo, why didn't you tell me? Oh my gosh, I seriously need to clean my glasses. It's okay, it's fine. We are not operating on the edge of a cliff right now. It's cool, we're good. But anyway, I did decide to go ahead and pick up Neon Gods by Katie Roberts. This was a recommendation by Nakia, one of my friends and subscribers who recommended this to me on the Read Like My Subscribers project that I'm doing. And I picked it up and I'm having a great time with it so far. This is a Hades and Persephone retelling that I've heard a lot of really great things about, but I wasn't sure if it was going to be quite up my alley. And even still, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a new favorite. I don't think I'm going to be continuing with the series or anything like that. But for the most part, I'm having a fun time. So of course, this follows our main character, Persephone. And at the start of this story, she finds out that she is going to be engaged to Zeus against her will. Zeus is definitely a very intimidating, powerful figure. He's a very dangerous figure. And apparently he has killed like the last three of his wives or so everybody believes. And so now he wants to marry Persephone and her mother is just completely willing to basically sell her off to Zeus, right? Because her mother wants power. But Persephone is not having any of this. So she actually runs away. And so she ends up in Hades area. And so we're just getting to the part where she and Hades are kind of striking a bargain because Hades wants to get back at Zeus. And so Persephone says, use me, use me to get back at Zeus and also keep me safe for the next three months until I turn 25, because that's when I get my inheritance from my grandmother and I can basically leave Olympus. She wants to leave Olympus. She wants to just attend college like a normal person. And like I said, this is just so far a good fun time. This is one that I'm going into without very high expectations. Like I'm not really expecting it to have those harder hitting elements that I know really grab me in a romance. And I think going into it with proper expectation is what's making this like an okay reading experience. I am certainly going to be finishing this one, not today, but probably tomorrow. And then we can finally move on and make some more headway into my February TBR because I feel like for the last day or so since finishing the diamond eye, I have just been kind of stuck. Anyway, I've got to go ahead and head into the grocery store because I'm also going to pick up some lunch while I'm here and I will check in with you later. Saturday morning and I just got done filming a video and I'm also currently hosting sprints but I wanted to come on here and give you a quick reading update because I have since finished Neon Gods by Katie Roberts and I don't really have much else to say after my last clip. I ultimately had a really good time with it. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought that I would. There was just something about the overall plot of the story that I found really intriguing and fascinating and I liked Katie Roberts take on it. I actually wish that the world could have been explored a lot more because we're definitely tossed right in. We're immediately introduced to Persephone and we find out that she is living in the upper city in Olympus and there's a lower city where Hades resides and at this point Persephone kind of believes that Hades is a myth. So the upper city of Mount Olympus is ruled what are known as the 13. Hades was one of the 13 but in this world the titles of Hades and Zeus and Aphrodite and Demeter and all of that is actually passed down through bloodlines. So if I'm understanding this world correctly these are not actually gods they are mortal beings and the roles of these rulers are passed down through bloodlines. Everybody thought that Hades bloodline died out and that he no longer exists but in actuality there was a pact made between him and Zeus to restrict him to the lower city because there's conflict between the two. And in Upper Olympus, Zeus definitely has all the power, all of the control. He's not a very nice man. He is thought to have killed his last three wives. And at the start of the story, Persephone finds out that she is being forced to marry him because her mother wants power. She doesn't want to marry Zeus at all. And so she flees and she ends up crossing the river Styx and ends up in the lower city, which is where she meets Hades. And it goes from there. She and Hades kind of strike a bargain. Hades wants to get back at Zeus because Zeus ended up killing his parents and causing him to fulfill the role of Hades. And meanwhile, Persephone needs to be kept safe. Persephone is trying to leave Olympus and she has three months before she can do that before she turns 25 and her inheritance from her grandmother is released to her. But as y'all know, they start to build a relationship and trust between the two of them and they start to fall in love. And I just ultimately enjoyed watching their dynamic, but also the underlying political things that were happening and the overall plot trying to take down Zeus and things like that. This is definitely a smutty novel, y'all. There were multiple sex scenes in this book and I didn't hate all of them, you know. For the most part, I thought that they were very well done. The thing is, is that I still feel like there's only so many ways that you can write a sex scene. And when there's multiple in a book, it just kind of gets repetitive and redundant. And it doesn't have the same effect as maybe that first initial sex scene had. So this is definitely not a story that I really plan on continuing with in the future. And I knew that going in, but I also didn't think that I was going to have as much fun with this as I did. So ultimately this was a very pleasant reading experience. I gave this a solid four stars. I'm actually very glad that I read this. So thank you so much to Nakia, a member of my chaos squad for recommending this to me. It turned out really, really well. And in the meantime right now 
I am just trying to finish Defend the Dawn by Bridget Kemmerer and as of filming this video I have maybe 10 minutes left of my audiobook. I will certainly be finishing it today because I do not anticipate being able to read immersively for the next several weeks while I'm in my new grad course. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this, have a clean slate with regard to my immersive reads, and then I think I'm going to try to pick up the Happy Ever After playlist by Abby Jimenez because I'm still kind of in a romancy type of mood. Anyway y'all, that's the reading update. I need to go ahead and get back to sprints, get back to what I've been doing, but I will check in with you a little bit later. Hi friends, so it is currently Sunday morning and I realized yesterday when I filmed my update clip I didn't actually close out the vlog. I thought that I might do a little bit more b-roll and a couple of updates but I did not so I wanted to come on here and formally update this vlog which at this point I think is probably going to go up about a week late so I'm sorry about that. I just didn't get it edited and uploaded in time. That's the problem with vlogs. They're fun to film but they're a pain in the butt to edit. But anyway I did start the Happy Ever After playlist by Abby Jimenez yesterday and I'm actually going to finish it today. I'm busting through it a lot faster than I thought that I would so I thought that I would at least come on here and tell you what it's about, tell you about my feelings so far, and then give you a final wrap up once I'm done. This is following our main character Sloane and you meet Sloane in the friend zone which is book one in this series and I was really looking forward to Sloane's story because something pretty traumatic happens to her in book one. I'm not going to say anything about it for risk of spoilers but she definitely goes through something very heavy, very serious and I was very much looking forward to seeing her work through that in this story and I actually heard from Abby Jimenez that she wrote the Happy Ever After playlist first before the friend zone but she wanted to go ahead and give Sloane's story in this book a little bit of context so she made Sloane the best friend of the main character in the friend zone so that we would have a little bit of an idea of where Sloane was coming from at the start of the Happy Ever After playlist and so that made me even more excited to jump into this story. So in the story it is two years after the events of the friend zone and she is driving down the road and all of a sudden this dog like runs out in front of our car and ends up jumping through her sunroof and causes chaos for her and she tries to get in touch with his owner but the owner's phone is just going to voicemail so she continuously leaves voicemails for this dog's owner and she essentially takes ownership of the dog because she's frustrated that the owner is not getting back with her she's had to take the dog to the vet and feed him and all of this stuff and then eventually the owner Jason calls her back and they start up like this phone relationship they start talking to each other all of the time they have really good chemistry a lot of great banter between each other and they kind of start liking each other over the phone and Jason at the time has been in Australia and New Zealand he is actually a pretty well-known musician but Sloane doesn't know that at the time that she's talking to him and he comes back to LA and they meet and things kind of go from there and so in traditional Abby Jimenez form you were definitely getting to know these characters well and you were definitely falling for them and you're falling for them together you really want them together you really root for them there is definitely a lot of chemistry there now I will say that I don't love the fact that Jason is basically a famous musician that just really doesn't work for me and I think the reason it doesn't work for me is because it's very unrelatable how many of us are going to be able to relate to a rock star coming in and sweeping us off our feet it's basically wish fulfillment in a book and so that is really what I can't get behind in these love stories that feature rock stars because it doesn't feel very realistic it doesn't feel very relatable so even though I love the two characters in this story individually and I'm loving them together I am not really connecting with the complications that are coming in their relationship because a lot of it is currently stemming from Jason's career also I'm not really getting the development in Sloane's character that I was hoping to see because by the point that the story starts it's been two years since the events of the first book so even though she's still very much in her grief she's still very much not the full person that she was before the events in the first book she's trying to move on she's getting her life back together and so I feel like we missed some things going on in that two-year gap I was hoping to see that a little bit more in this book I do feel like the relationship between her and Jason is progressing very very fast because they've only known each other for a few weeks they've only been officially dating for about three weeks at this point and they're already telling each other that they love each other and Jason already wants Sloane to go on tour with him and I feel like that's very unrealistic based on first of all the loss that Sloane experienced right she's still very much grieving she is ready to move on and she's ready to move on with Jason but I don't feel like she as a character would be willing to go this fast especially since she herself states in this book that it took her three years to move in with Brandon her former fiance so she's a very very slow moving person but yet all of a sudden she's going at lightning speed there are definitely some technical issues that I'm having with this one that I wasn't necessarily expecting I was expecting this one to probably be my favorite in the friend zone series and I'm still really enjoying their relationship of course I love Abby Jimenez's writing I love the way that she writes romantic relationships it's just the career that she chose for Jason and the way that she chose to progress this relationship so quickly is not quite working for me the way that I would have liked it to. I still have about an hour and a half of listening time left in the book so we're gonna see if anything like truly changes by the end of it but right now it's just sitting at a solid four stars and it's probably looking to be like my least favorite of the four that I will have read by the time that I finish this one which I wasn't necessarily expecting. It's still a solid romance and I'm very glad that I'm reading it but it's not quite up there with the other ones that I've read but anyway y'all I'm gonna go ahead and close out this vlog so that I can start the next 
one, and I'll talk to you then. Bye.